Lesson 13 Ablaze with God's Glory Sabbath Afternoon June 17 The fall of man filled all heaven with sorrow. The world that God had made was blighted with the curse of sin and inhabited by beings doomed to misery and death. There appeared no escape for those who had transgressed the law. The Son of God, heaven's glorious commander, was touched with pity for the fallen race. His heart was moved with infinite compassion as the woes of the lost world rose up before him. But divine love had conceived a plan whereby man might be redeemed. None but Christ could redeem fallen man from the curse of the law and bring him again into harmony with heaven. The plan of salvation had been laid before the creation of the earth, for Christ is the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Revelation chapter 13 verse 8 Yet it was a struggle even with the King of the universe to yield up His Son to die for the guilty race. But God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. John chapter 3, verse 16. Oh, the mystery of redemption, the love of God for a world that did not love him. Who can know the depths of that love which passeth knowledge? Through endless ages, immortal minds seeking to comprehend the mystery of that incomprehensible love will wonder and adore. Patriarchs and Prophets, page 63. The foundation of our hope in Christ is the fact that we recognize ourselves as sinners in need of restoration and redemption. It is because we are sinners that we have courage to claim Him as our Savior. Then let us take heed lest we deal with the erring in a way that would say to others that we have no need of redemption. Let us not denounce, condemn, and destroy as though we were faultless. It is the work of Christ to mend, to heal, to restore. God is love. He gives Satan no occasion for triumphing by making the worst appear or by exposing our weaknesses to our enemies. Christ came to bring salvation within the reach of all. The most erring, the most sinful, were not passed by. His labors were especially for those who most needed the salvation he came to bring. The greater their need of reform, the deeper was his interest, the greater his sympathy and the more earnest his labors. His great heart of love was stirred to its depths for the ones whose condition was most hopeless and who most needed his transforming grace. In Heavenly Places, page 291. Sunday, June 18. Preparing for the Final Crisis. The righteous and the wicked will still be living upon the earth in their mortal state. Men will be planting and building, eating and drinking, all unconscious that the final irrevocable decision has been pronounced in the sanctuary above. Before the flood, after Noah entered the ark, God shut him in and shut the ungodly out. But for seven days the people, knowing not that their doom was fixed, continued their careless, pleasure-loving life and mocked the warnings of impending judgment. So, says the Savior, shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Silently, unnoticed as the midnight thief, will come the decisive hour which marks the fixing of every man's destiny, the final withdrawal of mercy's offer to guilty men. The people are fast being lulled to a fatal security to be awakened only by the outpouring of the wrath of God. Maranatha, page 264. Every true follower of Christ has a work to do. God has given to every man his work. A few are now pointing to the role of fast-fulfilling prophecy and proclaiming, Get ready, show your obedience to God by keeping his commandments. 
Let everyone who loves God consider that now, while it is day, is the time to work, not among the sheep already in the fold, but to go out in search of the lost and perishing ones. These need to have special help to bring them back to the fold. Now is the time for the careless to arouse from their slumber. Now is the time to entreat that souls shall not only hear the word of God, but without delay secure oil in their vessels with their lamps. That oil is the righteousness of Christ. It represents character, and character is not transferable. No man can secure it for another. Each must obtain for himself a character purified from every stain of sin. Testimonies to Ministers and Gospel Workers, page 233. Therefore be ye also ready, for in such an hour as ye think not, the Son of Man cometh. Matthew chapter 24, verse 44. We know not the precise time when our Lord shall be revealed in the clouds of heaven, but he has told us that our only safety is in a constant readiness, a position of watching and waiting. Whether we have one year before us or five or ten, we are to be faithful to our trust today. We are to perform each day's duties as faithfully as though that day were to be our last. We are not doing the will of God if we wait in idleness. To every man he has given his work, and he expects each one to do his part with fidelity. As never before, resistance must be made against sin, against the powers of darkness. The time demands energetic and determined activity on the part of those who believe present truth. They should teach the truth by both precept and example that I may know him, page 358. Monday, June 19. Knowing the Truth Those who desire to find the treasures of truth must dig for them as the miner digs for the treasure hidden in the earth. No half-hearted indifferent work will avail. It is essential for old and young not only to read God's word, but to study it with wholehearted earnestness, praying and searching for truth as for hidden treasure. Those who do this will be rewarded, for Christ will quicken the understanding. Our salvation depends on a knowledge of the truth contained in the scriptures. It is God's will that we should possess this. Search, O oh search, the precious Bible, with hungry hearts. Explore God's word as the miner explores the earth to find veins of gold. Never give up the search until you have ascertained your relation to God and his will in regard to you. Christ declared, Whatsoever ye shall ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If ye shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. John chapter 14, verses 13 and 14. Christ's Object Lessons, page 111. Those who cry unto God for deliverance from the terrible spell that Satan would weave about them will set a high estimate upon the scriptures. Our only safety is in receiving the whole Bible, not taking merely detached portions, but believing the whole truth. Your feet are upon sliding sand if you depreciate one word that is written. The Bible is a divine communication and is as verily a message to the soul as though a voice from heaven were heard speaking to us. With what awe and reverence and humiliation should we come to the searching of the scriptures that we may learn of eternal realities? Let everyone study the Bible, knowing that the word of God is as enduring as the eternal throne. If you come to the study of the scriptures in humility, with earnest prayer for guidance, angels of God will open to you its living realities, and if you cherish the precepts of truth, they will be to you as a wall of fire against the temptations, delusions, and enchantments of Satan. Our High Calling, page 210. All who are traveling the road to heaven need a safe guide. We must not walk in human wisdom. 
It is our privilege to listen to the voice of Christ speaking to us as we walk the journey of life, and his words are always words of wisdom. Satan is working with great diligence to compass the ruin of the souls of men. He has come down with great power, knowing that he has but a short time to work. Our only safety lies in following closely after Christ, walking in his wisdom, and practicing his truth. We cannot always readily detect the working of Satan. We do not know where he lays his traps. But Jesus understands the subtle arts of the enemy, and he can keep our feet in safe paths. I am the way, the truth, and the life. John chapter 14, verse 6. Christ declares, Our High Calling, page 16. Tuesday, June 20. The Reformation Continues. And after these things I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power, and the earth was lightened with his glory. Revelation chapter 18, verse 1. The prophecies in the 18th of Revelation will soon be fulfilled. During the proclamation of the third angel's message, another angel is to come down from heaven, having great power, and the earth is to be lightened with his glory. There is to be at this period a series of events which will reveal that God is master of the situation. The truth will be proclaimed in clear, unmistakable language. As a people, we must prepare the way of the Lord under the overruling guidance of the Holy Spirit. The gospel is to be given in its purity. The stream of living water is to deepen and widen in its course. In all fields, nigh and afar off, men will be called from the plow and from the more common commercial business vocations that largely occupy the mind and will be educated in connection with men of experience. As they learn to labor effectively, they will proclaim the truth with power. Through most wonderful workings of divine providence, mountains of difficulties will be removed and cast into the sea. The message that means so much to the dwellers upon the earth will be heard and understood. Men will know what is truth. Onward and still onward, the work will advance until the whole earth shall have been warned. And then shall the end come. Maranatha, page 218. The great outpouring of the Spirit of God which lightens the whole earth with His glory will not come until we have enlightened people that know by experience what it means to be laborers together with God. When we have entire wholehearted consecration to the service of Christ, God will recognize the fact by an outpouring of His Spirit without measure. But this will not be while the largest portion of the church are not laborers together with God. God cannot pour out His Spirit when selfishness and self-indulgence are so manifest. When the hearts of the believers are warm with the love for God, they will do a continual work for Jesus. They will manifest the meekness of Christ and display a steadfast purpose that will not fail nor be discouraged. God will use humble men to do His work, for there is a large vineyard calling for laborers. The more closely believers have walked with God, the more clearly and powerfully have they testified of their Redeemer's love and of His saving grace. The men and women who through the long centuries of persecution and trial enjoyed a large measure of the presence of the Spirit in their lives have stood as signs and wonders in the world. My Life Today, page 59. Wednesday, June 21. God's glory fills the earth. We are not only to contemplate the glory of Christ, but also to speak of His excellences. Isaiah not only beheld the glory of Christ, but he also spoke of Him. While David mused, the fire burned. Then spoke he with his tongue. While he mused upon the wondrous love of God, he could not but speak of that which he saw and felt. Who can by faith behold the wonderful plan of redemption, the glory of the only begotten Son of God, and not speak of it? 
Who can contemplate the unfathomable love that was manifested upon the cross of Calvary in the death of Christ, that we might not perish but have everlasting life? Who can behold this and have no words with which to extol the Savior's glory? Thoughts from the Mount of Blessing, page 43. The Word of God reveals His character. He Himself has declared His infinite love and pity. When Moses prayed, Show me thy glory, the Lord answered, I will make all my goodness pass before thee. Exodus chapter 33, verses 18 and 19. This is His glory. The Lord passed before Moses and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. Exodus chapter 34, verses 6 and 7. He is slow to anger and of great kindness, because he delighteth in mercy. Jonah chapter 4, verse 2, and Micah chapter 7, verse 18. God has bound our hearts to Him by unnumbered tokens in heaven and in earth. Through the things of nature and the deepest and tenderest earthly ties that human hearts can know, He has sought to reveal Himself to us. Yet these but imperfectly represent His love. Steps to Christ, page 10. The unveiled glory of God no man could look upon and live, but Moses is assured that he shall behold as much of the divine glory as he can bear in his present mortal state. That hand that made the world, that holds the mountains in their places, takes this man of dust, this man of mighty faith, and mercifully covers him in a cleft of the rock, while the glory of God and all his goodness pass before him. Can we marvel that the excellent glory reflected from omnipotence shone in Moses' face with such brightness that the people could not look upon it? The impress of God was upon him, making him appear as one of the shining angels from the throne. This experience, above all else the assurance that God would hear his prayer and that the divine presence would attend him, was of more value to Moses as a leader than the learning of Egypt or all his attainments in military science. No earthly power or skill or learning can supply the place of God's immediate presence. In the history of Moses, we may see what intimate communion with God it is man's privilege to enjoy. To the transgressor, it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. But Moses was not afraid to be alone with the author of that law, which had been spoken with such awful grandeur from Mount Sinai, for his soul was in harmony with the will of his Maker. Testimonies for the Church, Volume 4, page 533. Thursday, June 22. The Lamb, the Slain Lamb. There are not many ways to heaven. Each one may not choose his own way. Christ says, I am the way. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Since the first gospel sermon was preached, when in Eden it was declared that the seed of the woman should bruise the serpent's head, Christ had been uplifted as the way, the truth, and the life. He was the way when Adam lived, when Abel presented to God the blood of the slain lamb, representing the blood of the Redeemer. Christ was the way by which patriarchs and prophets were saved. He is the way by which alone we can have access to God. The Desire of Ages, page 663. When the loud cry, It is finished, came from the lips of Christ, the priests were officiating in the temple. It was the hour of the evening sacrifice. The lamb representing Christ had been brought to be slain. Clothed in his significant and beautiful dress, the priest stood with lifted knife, as did Abraham when he was about to slay his son. With intense interest the people were looking on. But the earth trembles and quakes, for the Lord himself draws near. With a rending noise the inner veil of the temple is torn from top to bottom by an unseen hand, throwing open to the gaze of the multitude a place once filled with the presence of God. The most holy place of the earthly sanctuary is no longer sacred. All is terror and confusion. The priest is about to slay the victim, but the knife drops from his nerveless hand, and the lamb escapes. 
Type has met antitype in the death of God's Son. The great sacrifice has been made. It was as if a living voice had spoken to the worshipers. There is now an end to all sacrifices and offerings for sin. The Son of God is come according to his word. Lo, I come, in the volume of the book it is written of me, to do thy will, O God. By his own blood he entereth in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. Hebrews chapter 10 verse 7 and chapter 9 verse 12. The Desire of Ages, page 757. What a theme for meditation is the sacrifice that Jesus made for lost sinners. How shall we estimate the blessings thus brought within our reach? Could Jesus have suffered more? Could he have purchased for us richer blessings? Should it not melt the hardest heart when we remember that for our sakes he left the happiness and glory of heaven and suffered poverty and shame, cruel affliction, and a terrible death? Had he not by his death and resurrection opened for us the door of hope, we should have known nothing but the horrors and darkness and the miseries of despair. In our present state, favored and blessed as we are, we cannot realize from what depths we have been rescued. We cannot measure how much deeper our afflictions would have been, how much greater our woes, had not Jesus encircled us with his human arm of sympathy and love and lifted us up. Testimonies for the Church, Volume 5, page 316. For further reading, Our High Calling, The Cord Let Down from Heaven, page 45, and Reflecting Christ, The Truth Makes Us Free, page 114.